discrete time signals, discrete time systems. Um, discrete time signals are something that have been sampled in space or time. Discrete time systems are something that take as input a discrete time signal and outputs another one. There's one very, very special type of discrete time system that we must talk about, and that is the so-called linear time invariant systems. Okay? Lots of words for a very simple idea, and it's going to lead to a very, very powerful concept in all of signal processing, image processing, computer vision, robotics, machine learning, and deep neural networks. So let me first start off by talking about what a uh, linear time invariant system is. So remember again that a discrete time system, T, that you see over here, takes as input a signal and outputs another signal. Okay? So this, however, these linear time invariant systems have two properties. They are linear and time invariant, obviously. So let's see what's going to happen here. So I'm going to take a signal as input. I have F1 and F2, so two discrete time signals, and I'm going to scale them by A and B. First of all, what does it mean to scale a signal? Just multiply all the values by A. So it's just think about it as sort of a brightness um, enhancement. Uh, sorry, not a brightness enhancement, a multiplicative factor. So I'm going to multiply all the values by A in this signal, and I'm going to multiply all the values by B in this signal, and then I'm going to sum them up, of course, assuming that they're both the same length. So what goes into this linear time invariant system is a sum, F1 and F2, of two scaled by A and B signals, and that goes into T. And if it's a linear system, then out of the other side comes a scaled version of the first signal put through the system, so A times T, uh, F of 1, plus B times T of F of 2. So what that means is I can take two signals, sum them up, and multiply, multiply them by a value and sum them up, and put them into T. And that is exactly the same as putting F1 into T, multiplying the result by A. Put F2 into T, multiply the result by B, and then sum them up. So I'm just changing the order. That, of course, means that is the very definition of a linear system. Okay, so that deals with the linear part of an LTI, linear time invariant system. Now let's deal with the time invariant um, part. So let g of x equal t of f of x. So now I just have some signal f of x, I shove it into the system, t, and out comes g of x right there. Now, if I want to know what happens to the linear system when I put a, a time shifted or a phase shifted or a shifted version of the signal, so f of x minus x naught, that's how much I'm shifting it by, well, that's the same as shifting the output by the same amount as what you shifted the input by. So that's what time invariance means. It means the system doesn't care where the signal is aligned. Put any signal in there and get an output, shift the signal, you'll get this, the output shifted. Okay? So these two properties, linear and time invariant system, are very special. And they're special because lots of different systems happen to have linear and time invariance, and they lead to a really, really important concept, as I said earlier, to almost everything that comes next. So let's see why. Now, to understand the power and the importance of these linear time invariant systems, um, we need to go back to our delta representation of a signal. Okay? So let me remind you where we are. We have g of x is the output of a linear time invariant system t. So t takes as input some signal f and outputs a g. Okay, good. Now, remember that I can write any discrete time signal as a sum of scaled and shifted unit impulses. The unit impulse is a discrete time signal that has one at the origin and zero everywhere else. So again, f of x is equal to a sum, from, and I, by the way, I've made the bounds here minus infinity to infinity because I just don't know the bounds in my signal. But typically we are talking about discrete signals in space and time also, but I've just made the bounds infinite so I don't have to worry about how long the signal is. So it's a scaled version of f of x, f of k, the kth value of the signal, and then there is my shifted impulse. Okay? Now I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to shove it into t the discrete time system, and out comes g of x. Now, why did I do that? Well, let's, t is not just any system. It's a linear time invariant system. So let's see what happens now when we start to break this up. Okay, 
So let's, take, let's think about our linearity property of our discrete time signal. So the linearity property says that if I scale a signal and then put it into a system, I could have just put the signal in and then scaled it afterwards, right? That's the linearity part. So let's see what happens here. So T is my discrete time system. It's being multiplied by a scalar value. F of K is just the kth value in the signal. So that means I can pull that out and then just put in the shifted impulse. And of course, the sum, it works with the sum because that's a linearity property. So this sum is just sum this plus this plus this plus this, which is the sum of a bunch of scaled versions of discrete signals, the, the shifted impulses. So notice that what I've done here is I've pulled out that F sub K from the system, and now the system is only operating on the shifted impulses, and then I scale afterwards, taking advantage of the linearity of the LTI T. Okay? Now, of course, we want to take advantage of the time invariance, or the shift invariance, or the phase invariance of the LTI. So here, if we know that if t is being, is being passed delta of x minus k, and if, um, if I'm going to define h of x to be the output of a impulse function. So let's go all the way down here and say h of x is equal to t of delta of x, which just says put a delta in, one at the origin, zero everywhere else, and get a response. Once I have that response, I know the response to all shifted versions of the impulse. Why? Because time invariance tells me that if I shift the input, I shift the output. So if the output with no phase shift is h of x, well then the output here is going to be h of x minus k. And notice something unbelievable here is t has vanished, sort of. Right? So we started here with, I have some signal f of x. Um, I'm going to write it out as a sum of my, my scaled and phase shifted, time shifted um, unit impulses. The linearity property lets me factor out that f from the t, and the time invariance allows me to get rid of t entirely. And what that means now is that I take my t, a linear time invariant system, and I feed it a single signal, a unit impulse, the simplest possible signal, one at the origin, zero everywhere else, and I get a response. So out comes this h of x. Okay? And once I have that, I can throw away t. Why? Because I can take shifted versions of that h and compute this sum now and tell you what the output of the linear time invariant system is, and I don't need that box that was doing the calculation. So think, here's another way to think about it. t is some box. I shove a single signal in and I get some output. And from that output, I can tell you no matter what comes into that box, I can tell you what the, the box is going to say. That is amazing. A linear time invariant system is fully characterized by the unit impulse response. Tell me the output to one signal, I'll tell you the output to every possible signal you can come with because of both the linearity and the time invariant. And notice, by the way, I needed both of those. One was not enough. And, the, and this leads to this incredibly important concept of convolution. Okay? So what I'm showing you over here is uh, the same sum from the previous side. g of x is equal to the sum of the kth value of the input signal times a shifted version of the unit impulse. So here it is down here. h is just the output of the unit impulse. We're going to write this summation right here in one of two ways. You'll see it in both ways, so I just wanted to do both. Um, the standard way is the one on the bottom over here, which is that g of x is equal to f of x star convolved with h of x. The mathematically right way to write it is just above, and you'll see it both ways, but this is the more common way to write it, but you will see it here as well. That star operator is the so-called convolution operator, and it embodies a linear time invariant system. And it is determined, that h of x is determined again by simply putting a unit impulse into an LTI, getting the output, throwing the LTI away and saying, all right, I know what this thing is going to do, and now give me any input and I'll tell you what the output of that LTI is going to be by simply calculating this convolution sum. And you've probably heard of convolution, you've certainly heard of probably convolutional neural networks, 
That's this right here, and that's why this concept is so incredibly important. Okay, lots of notation there. I get that. Um, the, you, it, it, sometimes you have to sort of go back and look at this a couple of times and to distinct, make sure you're understanding all the terms. But conceptually, we have a very simple idea. We have a linear time invariant system. It obeys linearity, give it a sum of scaled signals, and it's the same as summing the scaled outputs. Give it a shifted signal, it's the same as shifting the output of an unshifted signal. Those two properties are very powerful because it tells me that any linear time invariant system is fully characterized by the output of a single um, unshifted unit impulse, and that's what leads to the convolution sum. Okay? Now, what do we do with that? Why is that powerful? What is that needed for? Where will we see it? Lots of that to come throughout the semester. But right now, the critical thing is to understand convolution sum in 1D, and we'll eventually build up to 2D and see the power of this linear time invariant systems.